Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Sober Bliss Meets. Today I am delighted because I'm joined by the lovely Jill McKay. Now Jill and I have met a few times and we initially met on LinkedIn, didn't we? Because uh, you sent right. me a copy of your book, which is amazing. Um, Jill is the author of the book Unstuck and she is also a coach and a trainer and you help other coaches and trainers, don't you? using neuroscience to right. help use the power of our brains in order to create long-lasting positive change in our lives. What a lovely way of, of, of putting it. Absolutely right, Gail. That's, that's exactly what I do. It's all about people stepping into the power of their brain and really understanding their difference, their uniqueness, because our brains are the most unique things that we have. Yeah, yeah. And Jill is here today because you're also a sober lady, aren't you, Jill? I am a very, very proud and very, very happy sober lady. Absolutely. So delighted to, to talk to you about that. Thank you for the opportunity, Gail. Yeah. Oh, I'm so excited for other people to hear your story because I've heard it and it is such a lovely story. And oh. you combine your knowledge of the brain, didn't you, to help you on your journey. Um, so do you just want to start and kind of give us a little bit of kind of backstory on why you decided to embark on this journey in the first place? Yeah, ab absolutely. So, so the, the, the journey of sobriety, which I, I just will say up front was entirely the best thing I ever did. If I say that in front of my three children or my husband, they look at me and say, oh, really? What about us being in your life? <laughs> but in terms of a choice, in terms of doing something for me proactively, I absolutely stand by that decision as being entirely the best thing that I did, Gail. It, it, it's yeah. it changed my life in so many unexpected ways, as well as those that I knew were, were in front of me. So mm. I think like many coaches and many of us who are involved in that whole self-development arena, we can be really good at talking to other people and helping other people to see the changes they make. In their lives yeah but sometimes it would blink at ourselves it's challenging for us to to do it for ourselves and it's it's dawned on me the irony is not lost on me that several times i've worked with people to or many times to create really step changes not necessarily on the sober scale but step changes in their lives that would make big difference for them and yet i was medicating myself through my own angst and my own stuff um, and now that I look back, it's actually really interesting to see how that's almost innately human. You know, we, we're compassionate and we help others. But let's also be compassionate to ourselves and, and help yeah. us ourselves too. So, so my story is probably one of, of you know, great familiarity to, to many of your, your followers and people in, in your community, Gail, and people that you're, you're working with. I'm, I'm a, a mum, I'm a, a juggling lady. Um, but, the, but at the same time, a very happy juggling lady. So I create busyness in my life. Um, I've enjoyed bringing up three children immensely. I, um, my eldest is 23, my youngest is 17 now. Um, I've enjoyed having a career. So in the early days, that was a corporate career. And then when Georgie, my youngest one, was, was born, I, I actually took a redundancy pack package, which was great. It gave me the opportunity to set up my coaching and training practice. On, on my own and on my own terms mm -hmm. and it's interesting it's through that stage that I started to notice the changes in terms of my drinking patterns so so here's the thing you know we're all smart women we're all smart people I think at an intellectual level we know what we're doing but yeah. it's when you start to notice at that emotional level that you know something's happening here that isn't quite congruent with the way I want to be and I'm hiding behind it that's when the alarm bells come up mm. and what I was doing with those alarm bells is I was just squashing them down with more Sauvignon Blanc <laughs> yeah. so, you know I was just medicating so my story at its simplest is one of being a juggling mum and also then very much being sandwich generation so with parents mm. as well aging parents and so we've lost throughout the last few years we've lost all four of our parents and the, the my mum had Parkinson's that was really quite challenging uh, my, my husband's father died of he had some kidney issues that, that compounded it. it was a quite a surprise he died quite young but since we had all, all three of our children um, and um, 
when my father died of old age. He's the only one I can say who, yep, he died of old age. And mm. then my mother-in-law lived with us and she was severely immobile and severely disabled. And it was, it was really a gift in many ways. And, and I was brought up was Scottish and I was brought up in the Scottish community where three generation families are, are very normal, it's very usual. Um, oh. So it was natural for us to bring my mother-in-law to us, particularly seeing she needed so much support. Mm. Um, and I think that was a really big part of the strain of just the, all this juggle. All of a sudden I had really a third person in our marriage, you know, an, an adult to look after who needed to, to be looked after. And I think neither my husband nor I were prepared for um, how much she emotionally needed to be looked after as well as the physical needs as well. So that really added into all of the, the kids, the, the grief from losing my own parents, the, the, the job and, you know, the ebbing and flowing of the job market. Mm. And then we had Margaret come in and really I started at that stage drinking an awful lot more. It was the way the pattern of my evenings Mm. Um, started to grow in terms of the amount of uh, nectar I consumed in my Sauvignon Blanc and yeah. I can look back now into it and see it very clearly it's at the time I was just making telling myself little lies really mm. and making excuses and thinking gosh I'm tired oh gosh we've got to do this extra thing for Margaret let's have a drink and staying up too late as well so we that was a, that was also a symptom so we could have time on our own after we put margaret to bed i was then drinking yeah more, even even more because i i chose to shift my bedtime too so that's kind of the backstory to mm. how it it evolved and i squashed my noticing of it throughout that backstory yeah 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 and how was it kind of making you feel so just before you got to the decision where you thought okay I need to make a choice here yes what was it like emotionally and how were you feeling oh, about the drinking complete up and down so you know I, I do like everybody who's listening to this you know we're all intelligent people so I went into that horrible spiral of beating myself up for doing something that I didn't want to do to myself and then giving myself excuses with the mantra of cutting myself some slack because I have a, had a challenging life and a very busy life. And I was in this spiral and I didn't want to drink much more, but I did because I thought I deserved to drink much mm. more. And it was giving me that I, I was sort of echoing, I was almost encouraging myself to drink <clears throat> more by telling myself that yeah. I deserved to do so. It's the reward. And I saw it as a reward. And actually, from a neuroscience perspective as well, it was giving me that hit. It was giving me that, that reward. What I know so much more now is that actually it had got to a craving perspective. So I was expecting it. Yeah. So, you know, my whole sort of physiology was actually tapping in to encourage me to do it more and more as well. So I was in this, from an emotional point of view, which is your question, I was in this kind of spiral. And what happens, I think, when you, in, when your rational mind says, look, you need to take some, make a choice, you need to do something about it, and yet your emotions and your behaviour and your actions are doing something different, is you start to beat yourself up even more. Mm. And that's that's the pattern that I got into, you know, oh, I'm rubbish, you know, I can't mm. do this, you know, I, I've changed habits before, I've done, and, I, and a lot of the work I do with my clients is about creating change in their life, whatever habit that might be, it might not be, it's not, not specifically the, the booze, but it's create doing something different creating a better future for themselves mm. so I, I got into that spiral of beating myself up and then what did I do when you beat yourself up you yeah. drink more or you give yourself you want to feel better so you give yourself more of a reward because mm. you deserve it you know in in, in your in your mantra so yeah. right before I made the decision that was I didn't feel good about myself at all because I just, I was sort of self-perpetuating those underlying feelings of, oh my God, Jill, you, you're weak, you're rubbish, you are, you know, you're, you're, all of this stuff you talk about, you're not doing it to yourself, you're a fraud, you know, mm. all of that stuff, it got, became quite dangerous, I think, when I look back now, it could have been quite dangerous, if I, yeah. if I hadn't have taken action, 
you know, I think it possibly would have rendered me, my confidence would have waned and waned and waned even more so that it would have affected my, my business and, and my life in so many other ways as well. Yeah. Mm, yeah, yeah. So was there a kind of defining moment when you thought, okay, come on, Jill, let's do this? It's really, really interesting. And like many of your, your um, group, your community, um, I read a lot. That was one of the things that really helped me was that yeah. I, I, I read an awful lot. So I didn't have what people define in their books and in their stories, a single rock bottom moment. You know, mm. I think that if you are, if you do wake up in an accident in an emergency or you are in a car crash or you, you, you do something appalling at a party you know yeah sure i did appalling things but nothing that was life stopping or or yeah. reputation busting you know there was nothing that was a a real rock bottom i think my life was full of little rock bottoms you know i, I bounced along the bottom of the of the river bed if you like mm. rather than you know creating a big hole in in, in the structure so i'd love to be able to in a way say oh it was that moment i think it was a an evolving erosion of my own self-esteem and, yeah. and there was one day I, I can't really recall a specific moment where I, I just thought from two angles I just thought I really don't like this I don't want my kids to you know see their mum like this that, that was a big motivator I think that, and, and when I put a voice to it it became oh my god that's really quite real the yeah. other thing was I'd put on quite a lot of weight with it. I wasn't sleeping well, so I didn't look particularly well. You know, I didn't look, I'm not that, I mean, I've still got my lockdown look here, but you know, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't proud. A lot of my work was um, pre-lockdown was um, going and speaking in, at conferences and standing on a stage and I kind of put on weight and I wasn't, everything was just physically below par. And there's no vanity in this at all, but I, it was kind of feeding that decision that, look at you, Jill, you know, you're mm. only in your mid fifties, you know, look at you, you're turning into something that is an image of another person. It's not the image of you, the real you. So yeah. I kind of, in an erosion, there was something around my kids and being a good role model and feeling, actually, I'm not a good role model. And mm. at the same time thinking, just, Look at you, look at what you've stepped into. And then owning the fact that I'd allowed myself to step into that and I didn't like what I saw. And that was my thunderbolt, really. You know, that combination. And I wasn't sleeping properly. I mean, we, we've all had this experience. I still don't sleep particularly well, but I know I was going up and getting up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, not just to go to the loo, but to drink water and to take my trusty ibuprofen. Mm. You know, I, I actually counted the other day um there's been a big box of tesco the supermarket ibuprofen that i've had you can buy a 50 50 box i've gone through that in a couple of months or a month and yeah. i think i've had it i had to throw it away because the sell by date had gone so it just wow. proved it's really interesting mm. and i hadn't noticed at the time until i did notice yeah. that my evening habit was go to the loo in the night water 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 pills Mm. You know, and oh by the way probably bumped my leg on the side of all, on the, the chest of drawers as I went past two you know my legs were covered in bruises yeah uh, and then feeling rubbish and mm. subpar in the mm. morning so there wasn't that rock bottom there was just a series of, of rock bottoms that eventually added into a realization that mm. I had to do something you know and that, that do something doing something resided with me yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's important as well. And it's a message that a lot of people need to hear because you don't have to have a rock bottom moment in order to change. A lot of people kind of get the feeling that, well, I'm okay, nothing bad has happened yet. So therefore, I don't need to. But what you just said there, the key is how it makes you feel. And if you don't feel good about it, if you don't feel good about yourself because of it, if you realize that it's making you become not the person you are really deep down, then, then that is enough. You know, you don't have to wait until something awful happens or somebody tells you that you need to stop. 
it is a choice, I think, yeah. and it's a very empowering choice. And I love it when you said that you had a thunderbolt moment where you realized this is not me. I want to be me again. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, and I think that there is huge power in that. And I think yeah. that we, if you, if you move it to other scenarios, moving away from the alcohol, let's say giving up cigarettes or losing weight, or weight is often talked about when people talk about changing habits. Mm. You know, you can't send somebody to Weight Watchers. Yeah. And, you know, they have to want to go to Weight Watchers. I mean, you can send them. You know, GPs can send, there's, there's, there's a big thing going on in the UK at the moment to lose five pounds because of the COVID, mm. thing, you know, the, the, the obesity link with COVID. And people need to want to do something to create change in their lives. And yeah. the irony really isn't lost on me that all of my work is about empowering people to step into their, their unique them and their difference and really honor and embrace that. Mm. And I'd allowed the alcohol giving myself the excuse of the alcohol the, the alcohol was the powerhouse in my life rather yeah. than me being the powerhouse in my life mm. um what we, we everybody has to realize in any scenarios that we have a choice you know, mm. in, in, and when we realize and we own that we have a choice in anything in life even in the direst circumstances yeah. that can be extremely empowering you know it's it, when we take yeah. our power back I'm not yeah. saying it's easy, Gail. I'm not. And I know you're not either. Mm. Actually taking that first step to walk through the doors of Weight Watchers and want to do it mm. or, you know, to, to put away the cigarettes and rip them up or to say goodbye to your soda and your blood bottles. Mm. It really is empowering to do so. And actually, I think we also recognize that sometimes there might even be a degree of mourning. You know, we have to own that too. Yeah. You know, because you're when you step into any change, you're stepping into something new. So mm. what are you going to do to replace and reward yourself? Maybe if that was your reason for drinking, for instance, what are you going to do differently um, mm. to, to, to make yourself feel that you deserve it and that the it is something different? It's not yeah. just serving your blunt anymore. Exactly, exactly. So what did you do then, Jill? How did you well, get through it? It's really, it, it's, it's, everybody has their own journey and, and part of the way that I operate, I'm a big reader um, mm. and I have to in my world of work. I, neuroscience is an emerging science, so there's always something new to learn. Um, and I, I came across um, a couple of websites and uh, listened to some podcasts and then started you know, getting very friendly with the Amazon delivery driver because I was ordering anything, <laughs> all the chick lit, you know, as I yeah. think it was, you know, lots and lots of literature. But I was also very, also very fortunate because a lady I knew who was um, uh, not, not related to me, my, my mother's best friend at university, one of that lady is my aunt's sons, had remarried a lady and she was sober. Mm. And she talked very openly about her alcohol journey. So it was really interesting for me to find somebody who was kind of in my family-ish circle, who was very mm -hmm. open about it. Now she'd gone the AA route. Mm -hmm. And I used to listen to her stories and I, I, I think, oh, that's not for me. She's an absolute advocate. And I, and I think the whole thing is, that it's about owning your own path and your own choices and what yeah. you want to go for. I, I know my own learning styles. I know my, my way of operating. And, and I just felt that uh, for me, I didn't want to take the one day at a time kind of philosophy and even mm. though i do believe in that every day is a new day but i also believe that today we can choose our future for yeah. tomorrow so i wanted to make that choice today and feel for me as though i had made a single decision there mm. was something around that that really mattered to me i didn't want to revisit every day and say what choice am i going to make today over the alcohol I wanted that choice to have been made. And yeah. so I did a lot of research around that. And, and many of the, 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 the sober people, the people who've been through the journey, also advocate that approach. You know, you make a decision and then you create everything in your life around confirming that decision mm -hmm. and giving yourself compassion and, and you know, listening to yourself and, and giving yourself that space to mm -hmm. confirm that decision and feed that decision. So that's what I did. I did a lot of research and then I didn't, 
even plan the day that I was going to do it. It was, when I say a lot of research, we're talking about a week, 10 days. Mm. I was, I'd, I'd made a decision that this wasn't going to be an excuse. Mm. I need to search a path for me. And I say this wearing the hat of a, a previously failed, don't like that word, but failed Weight Watchers lady. <laughs> okay. You know, so I understood as well as my work, you know, I'd been through, I'd been to swimming clubs before, you know, and I kind mm. of thought, right, how is this not going to replicate that yeah. kind of pattern? What am I going to do differently? Mm. So I think it was, it happened to be a Monday that I gave up, uh, that, I, that I just, I said goodbye. I just thought, right, okay, today's the day I've read enough. There's, you know, I know there's loads more to read. Mm. What I read in the future will confirm what I've done. And yeah. um, so I gave up on a Monday and um, fully supported by my family, fully supported by my husband, who also, he, and it was really helpful. He also stopped for a while, a few months until we went on, it was in the March. We went on holiday in the July and he didn't have his first drink until we, we um, he got on the plane. <laughs> But that's hugely support. It was very helpful yes. for me. And also what was very helpful was that in our house, uh, my mother-in-law drank a glass of whiskey every night. And by God, she needed it because she was in pain with her disabilities. And the great thing for me was that I loathed whiskey. So I was oh. really fine pouring her out her, you know, she said it was a single dram, but it really wasn't, you know, pouring out her, that was fine with me because mm. you know, and I had to think this through that she drinks every night, you know, I had to think this through. It was not a problem. So it was a series of a, a bit of research and a single decision that really mattered. And then we had a laugh about a year after I'd given up because I was cleaning out um, uh, the, the, the utility room where, where we just had some bottles of stuff and I thought it was, you know, old bottles of squash and stuff. And we found a bottle of Cloudy Bay, which is a really celebration type. Somebody had given it to us. And I laughed. I thought, why did I not have my swan song with this expensive bottle of wine? <laughs> but there yeah. really wasn't a swan song. It was just a, a, a normal, in the old days, an old normal evening. Yeah. And done. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> for the last carrot, the last ibuprofen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah oh I love that I love it that you like me made the decision because yeah. I do agree with what you said about that um yeah and I often quote as you know the Michael Jordan quote when he said once I made a decision I never thought about it again yes and it was the same for me and I found it liberating yes. because I didn't have to think about it again like you just said you didn't want to revisit the same choice every single day um you could then shape your life around your choice yes so yeah. what kind of things did you do to create this new alcohol free life for yourself so because i was very conscious of the fact that the alcohol was my reward mm -hmm. I, I i cut myself some slack in terms of what i was putting into my mouth you know but when we give up something like smoking or drinking it's not just the the, the nectar the golden nectar and the, the joy of the the taste or the, the the effect it's also all the motor actions associated with it as well yeah so i knew i had to do things with my hands and i knew i had to you know maybe i needed different tastes to enjoy that felt rewarding so i actually i started making different types of ice cream i, I mm. cut myself some slack in terms of sugar you know mm. and one of the things that i've also learned on this journey is it's not necessarily the alcohol craving that you're feeling it's the craving of the sugar yeah. so one of the books gave me the fact that um even if you're caning a bottle of vodka a night you know i, I was a wine lady that within 10 days and i think it's that period correct me if i'm not wrong physically the alcohol is out of your body it's, it's come through if you're, if you're not feeding it with anything else mm. and what you feel uh, you feel the it cravings for the emotions that it was satisfying but from a physical perspective particularly with wine you're craving sugar yeah and that's really really interesting so i kind of I read that so i started baking a bit more so from a sugar yeah and, but that was doing something and it was lovely yeah. because um I was doing it with, I had two of my kids were at university, but my daughter was still at home. And so we started a baking habit, which was 
a lovely thing to do. We yeah. also switched up our evening habit by literally changing rooms. So we were oh. we went to sit in my mother-in-law's annex. So even though there was a smell of whiskey, that we'd normally bring her to sit with us in our big kitchen. Mm -hmm. um, so we'd go and sit in her annex, or we had a little sitting room at the front. We 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 deliberately changed up our evening space. It's a small thing. I mean, obviously you have to have a you know the room to be able to do that. So we moved out of our kitchen. We had a little sofa in the kitchen, and we used to all all sit there um, mm. in the evening. We moved out of that and and moved to a different space and yeah. had the cake. You know, so I wasn't near the fridge. I wasn't near yeah. the wine. We had I had a little wine fridge underneath the, one of one of our units. I wasn't near that. But I didn't get rid of any of the wine in the house. We we st my, my I think we had no more white wine, which is what was my thing. That was a conscious decision. But we still had red wine, which mm -hmm. occasionally I would drink, because I felt that. And my husband is a gin collector, so oh. he's not a big gin drinker. He just has fallen into that fashion, if you like. Gin's a big thing, isn't it? Mm. So he changed up my my Virgin Wine subscription for the craft gin gin club subscription so and it's beautiful it's a display of beautiful labels and bottles and then he'll he'll occasionally you know have that so it wasn't for me about getting rid of the alcohol out of the house that that, that remained there that stayed there as i say my mother-in-law was still drinking her whiskey my mm. personal habits were because it, it was evening for me my personal habits were move rooms yeah mm. use my hands yeah, yeah. And that, that was really good and i i actually probably replaced well not even probably i did start to eat dessert ice creams or um or a, a, a little bit of cake in the evening but that was something i could control you know i was getting mm. i wasn't eating the whole cake you know yeah. allowing myself and enjoying and savoring i decided to enjoy my food in a different way and allow mm. myself that that treat you know the yeah. my replacement treat and I think I put it in my book actually when I talk. But my book isn't about sobriety, but in the habit change chapter in my book, I yeah. wrote a little bit around that. But I figured that you know, if I could quit quit the booze, I could sort out my chocolate brownie habit later. You know, yeah. and I can. You know, and it, and it was important to feel that I was rewarding myself. I also did. Um, I kind of reframed the whole evening routine with my mm. mother-in-law and this sort of negative bias of. You know, oh gosh, there are three of us in this marriage, and it wasn't around that. I went right back to the the the, the core reason why she was with us, which was actually my idea to bring her in into our family. And so evenings just became more relaxed around. Yeah. They were just evenings, so I, I would treat myself a little bit more and go and have you know not every night, but I'd go and have a you know a lovely bath a couple of times a week and just enjoy that sort of evening habit and just giving myself a little bit more kindness yeah. you know I, I think it, and it gave me the space it freed my brain fog and mm. gave me the space to realize that actually my evenings were completely wasted you know yeah. I was just in a fog just watching the telly mm. probably sitting in there in some sort of resentful stage you know my poor mother-in-law had been invited by me and I got into this horrible you know stage of, of resenting her presence you know, and, and everything kind of lifted so you know there are lots of things that, that you can consciously do to change up your pattern you know going out for a walk in the evening you know having a bath check you know giving us cooking something for the next day keeping yourself busy but for me it was also being aware of the hand i've got a friend who's a mm. friend who went to alcoholic anonymous she took up knitting and that really helped her so she knits in the evening doing some mm. changes with her hands yeah 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 oh, i love that and i agree it's about finding something that you enjoy something that is like a treat a reward um yeah i was the same i think i spent about two months watching tv and eating chocolate and cake as well um <laughs> but i don't do that anymore and like you i wasn't particularly worried about it at the time but it helped me through and, and i think that's key whatever works really whatever makes you feel good whatever yeah. allows you to show yourself that love and kindness again because let's face it when we're drinking we're not really being very kind to ourselves we think we are but, but we're not really and i'm a great big believer in showing yourself love and kindness so whatever whatever you want to do 
Yes. Then just do it and don't feel bad about it at yes. all. I completely, I completely agree. And you're right. It's a, a, it's a, it's a reframe, isn't it? Mm. We think we're being kind by rewarding ourselves with the alcohol, and it's only when we're out of it that we realise that that's not kind because we're yeah. actually, at its core, we're feeding ourselves with poison. Yeah, yeah. I fully admit that my part of mine was medication to hold down the grief of, you know, losing my parents and things perhaps not being going so right in my business and just being challenging. The mm. day-to-day -day was challenging. So here's the thing, the day-to-day -day is still challenging. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but I cope with it in a different way. In fact, I don't even think the word cope is part of my vocabulary. It's mm. just day-to-day. -day. Yeah. Um, and I, I feel so much um, more able and freer to make weighted choices and, and better decisions mm. uh, because because my head's free I, I don't I don't have that that brain fog and fuzz and, and all that emotional entanglement mm. of the, the alcohol within me it's very very freeing in, in so many more ways than I thought originally yeah and that's love that's giving yourself love it is to, to say actually I'm doing something I own it I'm doing something that isn't really that good. So I'm going to do something else. And for me, what's come out of it, not in a million years would I have been able to write my book if I'd been drinking. I know I wouldn't. Wow. Um, you know, I had it in me, and all that intellectual capacity, all that research, all that desire, the, yeah, I had it in me. I, I knew what I wanted to write about. It is a business book, but I, it's a book to help other coaches think about learning a little bit more about neuroscience to help them in their work and I want to share that the benefits it's given my clients I knew I had it in me in you know sort of from a capacity point of view but from a physical capacity point of view and a focus capacity yeah it would have taken years and then what would have happened I'd have been back in that spiral of oh god I, I started this and I didn't finish it and mm. I'm rubbish at writing you know there's something there's power in that and the, the other thing that happened, and it wasn't a direct result of the drinking, but it was a direct result of the, the self-care and the awareness, was that I took up running. So, oh, wow. and, and, you know, in the 50s, I joined a wonderful running club, and we're probably the slowest group in the entire world, you know. <laughs> Who cares? Who cares? And that is also, it's nothing to do with competition or speed. It's to do with health, well-being, and actually, for me, socialising as well. Yeah. And so interestingly, in that group, there are a couple of other ladies. It's not a female running club. It's a, a, a local running club. But there are a couple of ladies who, interestingly, have very openly shared their same stories as me. They've mm. gone and made healthier lifestyle decisions later on in their life for, for, for various reasons. I do remember a, um, I went to a seminar, a sober seminar in London a couple of years ago, run by a, 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 a different uh, website. And... Um, I did it because it was in London, it was lovely, and I, I, I participated a bit in their work. But one lady said in the audience, she was thinking about giving up drinking. Good for her to come to a group to talk about it. Good to her. Good for mm. her. And she was listening to the stories and she said, I don't, I, I don't want to write a book and take up running if I give up drinking. And it was really, and I think that's a real message. You know, this, that's my story. Yeah. It's little things that are the changes. For me, the best thing is being able to get up in the morning without a sore head and yeah. feel quite and know that if I'm tired it's my menopause you know it's not it's not my or it's the, the really strange weather we're having in the UK at the moment yeah it's blues, you know yeah. and, and, and to have it's the clarity of thinking that's been such a gift and mm. the, it's the knowing that I can sounds awful I can leave somewhere in the evening if everybody else has been a bit silly and wants to go on till four in the morning that's fab but I can go back and do what I want <laughs> and I probably yeah. won't even notice that I've left and <laughs> I thrive you know it, it, yeah. it's freedom it, it's mm. you it all sounds quite logical but it's not till you're there that you realize just how powerful that is that it's those little ones you don't have to start running or run a marathon or write a book it's those little things those moments and I, I, one, one other thing is is the sense of pride and achievement I mean that's yeah. what does the MasterCard advert say that's priceless mm. it, it, you know to because you start feeling good about yourself owning it 
mm. owning your backstory and then thinking, oh, it's a backstory. It's not your future story. Yeah. And, yeah. and that you yourself have created the power and made a choice to be able to create that future story. And it hasn't got one bottle of Sauvignon Blanc in it, which is great. Yeah. Yeah. It's all <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I love that. And it's so true. Um, Because you can make your life however you want to make it. Um, I wrote a blog post about that the other day, actually. Um, And it it is true. You can do whatever you want with your newfound clarity and energy and freedom. You don't have to do what everybody else is doing. In fact, you shouldn't do what everybody else is doing. Um, And the fact that you can is just so liberating and empowering like you said you are in control you can do what you want with your life now and even if it is the small things and I totally get the small things because for me they were the small things were huge waking up in the morning feeling normal I was like my god is this what normal feels like this is amazing and because I'd been used to feeling like crap basically for years and years and years so that small thing is a big thing and even if that's all you hold on to then I just think it's the best feeling in the world I absolutely agree yeah. Yeah. yeah and it makes such a difference to how you know this this evolves that feeling of pride and you know there's no shame in my story none you know, I think in the t- at the time I was embroiled in shame that I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have used that language. Yeah. And now when I look back, I, 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 I just want to hug that Jill then because I probably was embroiled in shame. But there is mm. now, the shame has been replaced by a bit of relief, obviously, but pride because it was a choice. Yeah. And I think we all know when we take good choices even though they might be tough at the time, mm. but how they will, you will feel about it afterwards. And that yeah. can only be a positive place to be. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so what advice would you give to somebody who's listening to this, watching this, thinking, oh, this sounds so amazing, I want that, but I don't know where to start, I don't know what to do. Yeah, so the, the first thing I would say is, just be kind to yourself. Just be, yeah. if, if, if you have come to the point where you you feel you need to do something, then I just give you the biggest hug and the biggest congratulations because yeah. getting to that point and owning it is the best first step. Mm. And once you've got to that point, you know, it's like the way the people who are forced to go to Weight Watchers. Yeah. Nothing's going to happen unless you want to do it yourself. So when you've got to that point, just huge congratulations and then it's about finding your path so for me it was about finding your make making that single decision i would advise because there's so much more on the market the support through gail you know i would advise joining her community i, I really would because that's where you will get your love and support and and, and lots of ideas as well and 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 then open they're open to ideas which i think it's a, a proper sharing community so i would yeah. absolutely talk to people about it but I'm not saying necessarily follow my path but what worked for me was definitely doing reading there's an awful lot more available even three years on from when I said goodbye to my Sauvignon there's a lot more published out there you know I I would get hold of some of some of the books um the books there and I think you've 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 talked about the the naked mind there's the sober risters that there's there's so much out there Mm. um lots of women actually uh, who've who've written those books um so I would do some reading around it um and think for yourself you know what would you what would you like your ideal future to look like you know Mm. and I'm not talking about being a millionaire and living in Hawaii you know if that yeah if that's right that's great I'm just talking about what would a good day look like next week? Or what would a good day look like in two weeks? Yeah. Because it really, really, really is possible. And it's those little things. It's about getting out of bed, opening the curtains, smelling the rain or seeing the sun and thinking, wow, what a great day. That's yeah. really what it's about. So mm-hmm. just ask yourself, what, what, is, 
you know, what what will it look like? And if you're if you're not convinced, then something as simple as a pros and cons list will really help mm. as well. You know, what are the what are the pros? What are the what are the uh, the against? And just revisit it later because if you've got any reasons for against, you know, maybe you're still in some excuses. You know, I just congratulate you if you've got to this point. Good. Be kind to yourself and then work out work out your path forward. But keep talking to people. I think that's really yeah. really a, a a big a, a, a piece of advice from my heart share because mm. you will find people who've done this before who will support you through it 100 percent yeah yeah oh thank you jill that's so lovely to hear um, pleasure and i'm so pleased that you've come on today to share your story and your experiences and know that it will help so many people Thank you, Gail. Well, thank you for inviting me. And I, I, I reiterate what I said a, a few minutes ago. There's there's no shame in this. You know, there's, yeah. there's really only joy and power. And, um, you know, and I, I applaud anybody who's listened, who's got to this stage and listened listen to this stage. But there really is so much support out there. Mm. Um, and, and it's about taking a few little steps. Well, actually, it starts with one step. And that's yeah. a great, great place to start. So yeah. thank you inviting me Gail. Yeah. Oh my pleasure. I love talking to you, Jill. Yeah, Thank you. Too. You're doing great work, Gail. Absolutely. Oh, thank you.